Amen. I really enjoyed that song. Amen. Uh, today is the day of salvation, the Lord says. And I believe as we study prophecy, we talked about uh, so many things, but if there's one thing we need to understand is time. Time is very important. And uh, the Bible tells us that uh, there, there, there's something we'll be studying today which fits in perfectly with that song, the first part of our sermon, anyway, uh, as it relates to prophecy. Because uh, if there's one thing that always gets us in trouble, it's to think that we have more time. It's not going to be right now. It's going to happen sometime later, but we have more time. But I'm so happy that the song reminds us Today is the day of salvation. Don't put off for tomorrow what you can do today. Amen? Amen? Could you bow your heads with me as we pray to begin? Father, we just thank you for blessing us today uh, to be in your presence. And we pray that as we study your words that you will be able to give us understanding. May your spirit come and dwell with us now. And in everything, Lord, we promise to give you the glory, the honor, and the praise, because you are worthy. It's my prayer, like God's people say. Amen. Amen. So today we're doing the calculus of time. Anybody brought their calculator with them? Anyone is ready to do some multiplication, some addition, and subtraction? Uh, are you ready? We're ready. Good, good. Calculus of prophecy. Let's do the next slide. Next slide. Uh, there is something in prophecy called the prophetic time perception. Uh, yes, you can go to the next slide. If you look on the screen, we have a, a demonstration of what it is when light travels through different mediums. For example, if you want to look a little shorter, go in the swimming pool and look through water at, at yourself. Have you ever noticed that before? That your body looks shorter in water than in real life. And, and what is really happening is as light travels from air and then it goes into water, the, the light rays bend. And so things look a little shorter and they don't look exactly, they don't seem exactly where they are. If you drop something in a pool and you're standing outside of the pool and uh, you're trying to get it, a lot of times what will happen is you, you place your hand where the thing looks to be, but it isn't. And the reason for that is there's an optical illusion that happens, and that's what happens when light moves through different media. How does that relate to spirituality? Next slide. As we look at it from the Bible, the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. What book did I say? 2 Peter 3, verse 8. And many people apply this principle to prophecy in general. And they say that this is the only principle that should be applied to prophecy as it relates to timing. And the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, do not forget this one thing, the law, that one day is with the Lord as a what? A thousand. And a thousand years as? Are you still with me? One day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. And people use this to say, time does not matter with the Lord. They use this to say, time does not matter with the, the Lord. It is an incorrect use of this text. What this text is saying, we will find from scripture, is sometimes the Lord is patient. We talked about that the Lord gives a very long time for us to get things right. But when he is ready, when he is ready, God moves very swiftly. 
So God may be patient, but when his patience runs out, the lateral movements are very swift movements. Let's go to the next slide. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, see, people uh, have a problem with God sometimes because God sometimes doesn't do things in the time that you want him to do it. And a lot of people ask the question, how long, Lord? You hear that question in Revelation, how long? You see these things happening on earth. People are dying. There, there are destructions happening everywhere. How long? What are you waiting on? And, and, and that's one of the reasons why God says we should write down our prophecies, the prophetic uh, understanding that we have, turn to the next slide, chapter 2 verse 3 says, for the vision is yet for what? But at the end it shall speak and not and not lie. God's word is true. It will speak and not lie. And here is the paradox. Prophetic time perception. The Bible says, though it do what? It means even though there seems to be a delay in God doing what he said he would do, we are to be patient and to wait on the Lord. Though the vision tarry, wait for it, right? So that's one principle. But look at, at the paradox. Because it will surely come, it will not tarry. How does something tarry? But not tired. Are you seeing it? Are you seeing it? How does something tarry that you have to wait for it? And then on, a, on another hand, it doesn't tarry. Well, the Bible answers that question because in the New Testament, next slide, in the New Testament, the Bible talks about people, how people behave when they think they have more time. Uh, scripture says, if the servant, and Matthew calls that servant an evil servant, if the servant shall say in his heart, my Lord does what? Delays his coming. So the servant says, man, I got time. Lord delays his coming, and instead of doing the work that he should be doing, he starts beating up on the little servant and uh, starts to eat and to drink and be drunk. And next slide. The Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and at an hour when he is what? Amen. And will cut him in sunder and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. See, the vision will tarry. It will look as if it's not going to happen. And then because of that perception, many of us change our behavior. I don't know about you, but where is the spirit of the church? I'm going to talk to the church today. See, Adventism started out as a movement where people were willing to sacrifice their own ambitions in order to spread the good news of Jesus' coming. Are you still with me? J.N. Andrews had aspirations of becoming the president of the United States of America. He gave that up in order to be a missionary. The problem with us today in the church, in Laodicea, is we think we have more time. And that's why we have left off the primary work of warning others about Jesus' is coming and we have become engulfed in eating and drinking and giving in marriage. Are you still with me? See, there's nothing wrong with eating and drinking, but if all you live for is to acquire stuff, to go to school and to get educated, nothing wrong with that. Is there anything wrong with that? No. 
But as a church, our primary focus should be on telling others about Jesus' coming. Do a quick calculation in your head. How much time do you spend in prayer daily? Versus how much time you spend worrying about your finances? Hmm. Now a quick calculation. How much time do you spend talking about the faults of others? Versus how much time you spend praying for others? Now a quick calculation in your head. How much time do you spend relating to family about Jesus' coming? Versus how much time you spend relating to your kids about doing their homework. Don't, 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 don't say that out loud now. We say the Lord delays his coming, but, but, but this is what we have to understand. God works within the fullness of time. God doesn't judge anything before it's time. But when the time comes... He acts swiftly. That's what Galatians chapter 4 verse 4 says. So that's the first thing, the perception of time. Something happens with prophecy that bends our perception. And many of us, even when things are happening around us, we see what is happening to Japan. We see what happened to, 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 the, to the eastern end of the, the globe. In the Middle East, we see the upheaval that is happening. We see what is happening here in America. And we still have the impression that there is more time. That's how we think. That's how we think. Next, next slide. And people have this impression that God doesn't work by principle. He just does things whenever he feels like doing things. Have you ever heard that? Nobody knows what God is doing. God's work is a mystery. Have you ever heard anybody say that before? His work is a mystery. Nobody can understand what he's doing, when he's doing. But God has given us prophetic time principles in the Bible to help us to know when he is going to do what he's going to do. Let me underline this by saying the Bible says, no man knows the day nor the hour when Jesus comes. Amen? So we don't know the end but we know when it's about to end. Are you hearing me? If I, if I can divert from the slides a little bit, Matthew chapter 24. Can you turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24? Look at verse 6. Bible says, And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. See, when God speaks in prophecy, he tells you that you are close to the end, but he never tells you the exact ending. Are you hearing? We talked about that last week when we talked about the two minutes. Warning. God gives you a two-minute warning, prophetically speaking. Says, this game is wrapping up. You need to get your house in order, but he doesn't tell you when the game actually ends. Nobody knows the day nor the hour. Next slide. Here we have a mathematical function. We talked about that last week, that we'll be doing some math today. Everybody knows what that is. We have the x-axis and the y-axis. You're good students. Pat yourself on the back. And right in the upper left corner, we have a table of the graph. And the table says when x is negative 3, y is? Come on now, negative 30. When x is 0, y is? And when x is 3, y is 30. So that's the table. But we derive that table from the function of the graph, which says y is equal to 10 times x. So whatever x is, 
Y is 10 times that. Now, that's a very simple function. And uh, in, in, in math, a function is defined as a relationship that has a one-to-one -one mapping, which means you put one value of x in, and you get one value of y. Amen? Are you still with me? Your paycheck is a function. Somebody turned to your neighbor and said, your paycheck is a function. You know what the variables are? You pay is equal to the amount of time you work times your hourly rate. You're still with me. So when you look at your paycheck and you wonder why it's so low, <laughs> you got to go back and check two things. How long did you work? And what's your hourly rate? Somebody say amen. We're talking about functions here. You know, don't blame, don't, don't worry about how much you get paid. Worry about your, your, your hourly rate and how much you work. You're still with me, right? So kids, you'll never be able to be rich working at McDonald's. Amen? Amen. You can't work enough hours. The rate is too low. Somebody's still with me, huh? Amen. You're still with me, right? Amen. Okay, good. So, this is a mathematical function. Next slide. I think I missed something. But there are three major time periods in, in, in Daniel. Daniel 7 talks about time times, dividing up times. Daniel 8 verse 14 talks about 2,300 days. And Daniel 9 verse 24 talks about the 70 weeks. Next slide. The question we have to ask today is, does the scriptures speak of a function that can be used to map prophetic time to normal time? Are you still with me? Because these time periods in Daniel are all prophetic time. Amen? Amen? Is there a simple function in scripture that can be used to translate, to convert, to, uh, to take prophetic time and apply it to normal time? The answer is yes. Next slide. Look at what the Bible says in Numbers chapter 14, verse 34. What does it say? After the number of the days in which you spied out the land, even how many days? Are, are, are you there? 40 days. For every day of year. See, Jesus is good. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, Jesus is so kind. He gave a very simple function. He said, one day, one year. You understand? He didn't give a complicated one. He could have said, take the days, multiply by four, find the square of that, then do the cube root, and express it as a logarithmic function, and then you get your prophetic, the formula to translate prophetic uh, uh, to normal time. You see, we have some difficult formulas in life. Are you still with me? If you want to change from Celsius to Fahrenheit, I think you have to subtract 32 and then multiply by 5 over, 5 over 9 and some crazy stuff like that. If you want to move from pounds to, to kilograms, you have to multiply by 2.2 or some crazy figure. You go from uh, feet to miles, it's what, 6,752? 5298 All of this stuff. You know, that's why we don't know metric. You ask an American what's one kilogram, nobody has a clue. It's too difficult to convert between metric and uh, the old uh, English system. But God said, you know, I know people in church don't like math. Amen? They don't really like to do a lot of calculations. So let me let this thing be so simple. Every day will be equal to what? A year. And the context for this, Numbers chapter 14, verse 34, is very significant. The, the children of Israel were supposed to enter into the promised land, but because they were faithless, they said, let us check it out first before we enter in. Because, you know, you never know where God is leading you. The last time we followed his direction, we ended 
window between mountains and a big sea and a pursuing army. We're not doing that again. So let's check it out before we enter in. And when we check it out, they said, aha, uh -huh, I told you you can't trust God. They have some giants in the land and there's a plague in the land. We can't go in. And God said, because you spent 40 days weakening your faith, I will give you one year for each day you spent. And you will spend 40 years wandering in the wilderness. Are you still with me? Year for a day. Next scripture. Then Ezekiel chapter 4 verse 6. God says to Ezekiel, I want you to act out a parable. Do you remember back in the day when uh, uh, in order to send a message, young people, listen up now, listen up now. Uh, say thank the Lord for technology. You got to thank the Lord for technology now. Amen. You know, because back in the day, if something went wrong and you needed to send a message to your parents far away, you would have to buy... Oh, send a what? No, a telegram. You send a telegram. And how they would do it is they charge you by the letter. And so people would have to find a way to send a message in the shortest way possible while still understandable. So if you were in school and you ran out of money, you couldn't do the long conversation that kids do nowadays. Mommy, um, you know, I'm having some difficulty at school. It seems the inflationary rate has gone higher. Uh, the cost of living has adjusted, but our monthly income has not. You know, that's too long. You have to say, send money. Or something like that, you know. You know. So, so when God is doing things in prophetic time, He says to Ezekiel, "I want you to act out how long I will be punishing the children of Israel, but I cannot have you acting it out for the same time period." Are you hearing this? God is doing like a model, a scaled-down version of what He's going to do in reality. And so he tells him, I want you to lie on your right side for a certain number of days, and that will represent how long I will punish Israel. And then I want you to lie on your left side for a certain number of days, and that will represent how long I will punish uh, Judah. And then here's the principle again. He says, each day for a a year, same principle. Next slide. So we have just extrapolated that one prophetic day is equal to one normal year. Was that difficult? Raise your hand if that was difficult. And we need to go over it. Good students, you all have an A so far. So far. The final exam is coming up, you know. Final exam is coming up. So this function is given a name in Bible prophecy and it's called the day for a year principle. What is it called? We're going through all of this to get to the good stuff. Next slide. So we know that one prophetic day equal one normal year, but for the function to work, you have to translate everything to what? To days. First, next slide. Going from the biblical time period, things were a little different back then. A day would be equivalent. A week, you multiply by. A month, you would multiply by. And a year, you would multiply by. And as you can see, the monthly days and the yearly days are a little different than they are today. Amen? You may have to do some extracurricular work to find out why. But it was based on the Egyptian and Babylonian system. The Egyptian system was based on a year of 360 days. They would add five days and then adjust based on how the sun uh, operates. Do you know that we still do that today? That's why we have a leap year once every four years, except 
for uh, century years that cannot be divided by four. So 2,100 will not be a leap year. Are you still with me? That's the complications of today's yearly cycle. I'm saying all of that to say nobody knows the exact timing for a year is a very complicated thing. Are you still with me? You still with me? So just take it as it is that back then the year is 360. When you do that and the month is 30, you get some amazing things happening. Next slide. The three time periods now you can go into what would they be their daily figure. For Daniel 7 verse 25, we have a problem straight off. Time, times, and dividing the times. We have no clue what that means. So we need to find out from the linguistic clues what that means. Next slide. In Daniel 7 verse 25, there are two words for time used. The first one is used uh, is uh, the word zeman, which means season or time. Talks about the little horn changing seasons and time. The second word that is used, next slide, is idan which means a year. So when the Bible says time and times, it's saying one year, two years. All right, are you still with me? Next, next slide. And then when it says a dividing of times, the word that's used there is pila, which means half. So let's translate the whole thing. Next slide. Daniel 7 verse 25 tell, talks about one year, two years, and a half year. So add one plus two is? Plus a half is? Multiply 360 by three and a half. Let's go. And if you don't know how to multiply quickly, you can add. 360 plus 720. How much would that be? 1080. Correct? And then half of 360 is 180. You add it all together. 1080 plus 180 is 1260. Are you still with me? Come on now, folks. You're, you look depressed. You look depressed. No, Lord Jesus, don't put math and spirituality together. I will be lost if you do that. Come on now, you got, you got, you got to encourage yourself. This is simple math now. Simple math. No, no calculus here. All right, next. And that's the hardest thing. The 2,300 days is already in days. So we can leave that as it is. Next. The 70 weeks... To, to move from weeks to days, what do we need to do? Multiply by? Seven. Seven. So seven times 70 is? 490. 490. Amen. So we know the answer is 490 days. Next slide. So what we have in Daniel are three time periods. 1,260 1, days, 2,300 days, and... 490 days. Next slide. That translates real time into 1,260 years, 2,300 years, and 490 years. Amen. There ended our math session for today. Anybody happy? Amen. 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 Now we're going to go down to the real stuff. What does it mean? Next. And today we're just going to do the first time period. See, the first time period talks about the reign of the little horn. Next slide. And uh, when you uncover the 1260 days, something miraculous happens. See, the Bible says, uh, you, you know, there's a principle, the more work you do, the more pain you get, right? We talked about that. See, for all the work that we just did, it wasn't for nothing. 
with all the work that we did, we got something now that can be used as a bridge to join two books of the Bible together. It can be used as a bridge to join the book of Daniel with the book of Revelation. Look what happens. Next slide. This figure appears right after Daniel chap uh, Revelation chapter 10 tells us an angel appears from heaven and gives Daniel a little book and tells him to eat it and then to prophesy again to the nations. Remember, we talked about the fact that people have this feeling that Daniel is a closed book, Revelation is a closed book, and we, we explained to you that Revelation is the unveiling of what God is doing. And here, when God says, I'm giving you a book, and you can prophesy again, I believe he was talking about Daniel, the book of Daniel, because immediately after that, you see the figure 1260 popping up <coughs> five times. In the book of Revelation. Let's go through. Next slide. Revelation chapter 11 verse 3. And Revelation chapter 12 verse 6. It is talked about as the 1260 days. Is that the same figure? That's the same exact figure. Then in Revelation chapter 11 verse 2. And 13 verse 5. It's talked about as the 42 months. Is that the same figure? Right. We don't know. Multiply 42 by 30. Let's do it. 12, 60. 3 times, 0 times 2? 0. 4 times 2? 8. eight. Or 3 times 2, sorry. 6. Six. And then 3 times 4 is? 12. So you have 12, 60. Same exact figure. And then in Revelation chapter 12, verse 14, you have time times and dividing of time, which is the same three and a half years, which works out to be the same exact 1260. God has a way of telling us what he's going to do before he does it. And that shows you how powerful God is. Are you still with me? You know, it's a powerful person who can tell you what they're going to do and then do it. You know, I've never seen it in the movies before. They, 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 they give you a close-up of what is happening on the court, on a basketball court, for example. And, 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 and the guy will say, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to cross you over. I'm going to spin to my left, then spin to my right, step back, and shoot a three. And the defender would laugh. How oh, are you going to do that? You know, because you can't do that. I'm here guarding you. And... He does exactly what he said he's going to do. You know, so God did that in the Bible. He said, this is how much time I'm giving the devil to run his havoc in the world. Are you hearing me? As bad as he may see, this is all the time that he has. And after that time is up, though the vision tarry, wait for it, wait for it. Because when it happens, it will not tire, it will be swift. So God predicted way ahead of time how much time he would be given the devil to run his habit. Next slide. So characteristic number one, the little horn reigns, it dates during the reign of the fourth beast after ten divisions arise and three divisions are vanquished. We're going to go through these slides quickly. Daniel chapter 7, verse 23. It says, The fourth beast shall be the what? Fourth kingdom upon the earth shall be diverse from all the others. Next, next slide. And as for the ten horns out of this kingdom, shall how many kings arise? And then after those ten kings, another king shall arise. But how he gets to power is he destroys three kings. So the Bible tells you exactly what is going to happen before it happens. Next slide. So the first kingdom, kingdom of Babylon, head of gold. I kind of drew that. It looks, it looks more beautiful um, back then. 
As you can see, I am not very good at art. Next slide. Silver is medial burger, and that's supposed to be a chest and a thigh. Come on, folks. Be, be encouraging to your pastor. You know, just say, Pastor, you preach well and you draw too? That is marvelous. <laughs> the third slide. Third kingdom is the kingdom of bronze, which is Greece. 331 to 168. Fourth kingdom is iron, legs. Uh, those are legs, believe it or not. I tried really hard to, but uh, those are legs. And that's supposed to represent iron legs. Okay. Iron legs. And, it's, and then the last kingdom is the kingdom of iron and clay. See that? Partly iron, partly clay. Um, and at this point, I want to pause and invite those who can actually draw to help me out in future um, so that this doesn't happen again. Amen? Amen. This doesn't happen again. But, but be that as it may, the fourth kingdom was the kingdom of what? Go back to the previous slide. It was the kingdom of? Iron. Iron. And it's the kingdom of Rome. And after Rome, notice what happens. Go back to the divided kingdom. No, up. Next, yes. This kingdom is still Roman niche. Are you getting it? Every other kingdom, you move from gold to silver. There's no relationship between gold and silver. Then you move from silver to bronze. There's no relationship between silver and bronze. Then you move from bronze to iron, two diff completely different metals. When you move from the fourth kingdom to the divided kingdom, however, there are similarities which tells us that the fourth and the divided are similar because the divided kingdom is still Romanish. It's just not as strong and not as unified as the fourth kingdom was. So what happened to the fourth kingdom? Next, next slide. See, when Rome was in power, there was one Roman kingdom, one Roman empire, one man in charge. But then afterwards, Rome began to disintegrate. And over time, it disintegrated into 10 different warring tribes, if you, if you please. The barbarians came in and they divided up Rome. And most of these kingdoms still su survive to this day. Three of them were vanquished. And the last one was vanquished in the year 538 B.C. As a good teacher, I will not tell you everything. I will leave it to you to go find out which of the three were vanquished. So that next week when we come and we have our final exam, you can all get an A. Amen? Amen. I told you before it happened. So that when it happens, you may have faith. Amen? Amen. So the Anglo-Saxons, the Alemanni, the Ostrogoths, the Herolites, the Bur Burgundians. I thought that was the Burundians, but it's not. It's the Burgundians. Amen? The Burgundians. Those are the folks who love to wear red and black put it together, got Burgundy. That's a slight joke right there in prophecy. You can, you can do that. The Franks, these were not people who loved to eat sandwiches. Don't worry. The French, uh, the Vandals, the Visigoths, the Suebians, and the Lombards. And I may have not pronounced them properly, blending on my Jamaican accent. Somebody say amen. But the point is, Rome disintegrated to the point where there were ten kingdoms, and then three of them were destroyed. Next slide. The last of the three horns were uprooted by papal Rome in 538 AD. And then papal Rome's reign of terror continued until 1798. Quick question. Subtract those two numbers. What do you get? 1260. Are you cheating or are you doing it correctly? 
Let's go. 8 from 8 is? Talk to me, folks. 3 from 9 is? 6. 5 from 7 is? 2. And then you have nothing to take away from the 1. 1,200 and 60 years. Exactly. God says there's going to be a, 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 a power that's going to last for 1260 years exactly right after the fourth kingdom after the fourth kingdom has disintegrated into ten divisions and this power will take control after it has vanquished three of those divisions and it will last for 1260 years and that happened next slide what did the beast do during these 1260 years. It persecuted God's church, which had to go into hiding. Next slide. Daniel 7, verse 21, it says, I beheld the same horn, made war with the saints, and did what? Prevailed against them. Next slide. When we go to Revelation, we see the very same thing happening. The woman, which is a representation of the church, fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. Three score. A score is 20 years. Multiply three by 20, you get 60. Same figure. Next. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. Next slide. So the church had to flee. And you may wonder why are we talking about this? You get, you get the point. See, this is what this little horn does. It persecutes the church of God. And God waited a thousand two hundred and sixty years Think about that. Remember we talked about it last week. <laughs> oh, no. yeah. We're in all the saints. <laughs> A thousand two hundred and sixty days, years. And Big Daddy is right here sitting doing nothing. <laughs> so I begin to think if I can do that to the church, I can do that to Big Daddy, and nothing will happen. Are, are, are you still with me? See, because that's what the Bible says, because judgment isn't speedily executed, we become set in our ways and even vain in our imagination. What does vain in your imagination mean? It means you begin to think that you can do what you really cannot do. The devil became vain in his imagination. He thought that he could do anything. And so during this time, he also suppressed the scriptures. Look at what the Bible says. Next slide. The Bible talks about it in 11 verse 2 uh, and 3. Next slide. It says, and I will give power unto my two witnesses. And the two witnesses here, the Bible is talking about the Old Testament and the New Testament. And they shall prophesy, preach, a thousand two hundred and three score years. Same figure. But they are clothed in sackcloth. It means they're mourning. Do you know during this time period, you were not allowed to have a copy of the Bible? Let me see those who have your Bibles in church today. You'd all be in jail. <laughs> are, are you hearing me? The priests were not allowed to own a copy of the Bible for themselves. The Bible that each church had during that time was chained to its altar. Are you hearing me? And it was written in a language that nobody knew. So imagine if I came to church and I spoke Latin to you guys. 
straight Latin, and you just nod your head, pay your money, get your little blessing, and you're gone. The scripture was suppressed. And, 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 and we have to understand that when God's word is suppressed, only iniquity can abound. You know, the churches were in such ignorance that the, pre the priests were treated like princes while everybody else starved. I guess it's the opposite nowadays. Pastor is a pauper and everybody else is a prince. That's fine. But we live with that. Amen? That's a better arrangement. But the scriptures were suppressed. You don't know how precious the Bible is. People died so that you could have a Bible in your own language. Literally died, crucified, burned at the stake. But the scripture cannot be changed. Amen? Amen. Scripture cannot be changed. Next slide, next slide, next slide. The fourth thing is, and the last thing, is that the little foreign's reign would be marked by blasphemy against God and heavenly things. What does it mean to blaspheme? Next slide, we're going to run through this. We're closing. Says, and I stood upon the side of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having how many heads? Seven. Seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of what? Blasphemy. Blasphemy. What is blasphemy? Next. And the beast which I saw was like unto a. Where did we see that before? Daniel. The third beast was a leopard. Okay, and his feet were as the feet of a. Where did we see that before? In Daniel. The second beast was a beard. And his mouth as the mouth of a. Where did we see that before? Daniel. The first beast was a lion. And, and the dragon gave him his authority and his seat and great authority. Next. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. And his deadly wound was what? Yeah. And all the world wandered after the beast. Next slide. And they worshipped the beast. Next slide. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Next slide. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in the heaven. Next slide. So what is blasphemy? What are the special targets of people who know? Why does it matter today? We're ending. Next. See, it's important today because the Bible says, look what it says. One of the heads seemed to be wounded to death. But that wound was what? See, we think we're over with persecution. But the wound has been healed. And it's the same beast. If it's the same beast, it will exhibit the same behavior. Are you hearing me today? I said, if it's the same beast, you wound its head, and it looked as if it was dead. That's what it says, right? It looked as if it was wounded to death, but that deadly wound was healed. The wound has been healed. And the beast is just waiting to strike again. You know, the story goes that uh, a snake wanted to cross a, a, a very high precipice and uh, the, he asked an eagle if he could ride on his back across and the eagle said I, I don't trust you are you hearing me I don't trust you because you are a snake you're going to bite me the snake says what do I have to gain if I bite you we both die <laughs> 
So the ego says, yeah, you know, that makes sense. <laughs> That makes a lot of sense. We 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 in this thing together. So they formed a partnership, and the snake jumped on the eagle's back and they started flying, flying. And midway through the journey across the precipice, the, the the snake bit the eagle, and they both fell to the ground. And with the last dying breath, the eagle said, "I thought we had an agreement." <laughs> Snake said, I tried. You know, I'm just a snake. <laughs> and both of them died. And that was the end of the story right there. But, but, but the Bible says the wound is healed. We thought all those things were behind us. We thought we could all just get along right now. Jesus Christ is coming again and everybody will be singing Kumbaya and be getting together and we'll all be having a good time. But the wound has been healed. And the same behavior that the horn exhibited back then it will do today. It has not changed. That's right. Just wait, waiting for the right time to strike. What's blasphemy? Next slide. See why relevant today the wound is healed. Next slide. It has special targets against who? God, his name, his tabernacle, them that dwell in heaven. You will hear the weirdest things about God in some churches. They tell you that God is so wicked, he is so evil, for the sins of a life of only 10 or 12 or 20 years, however many years you may have lived, you are going to burn forever. Are you hearing me? I don't think you're hearing me. Yes, sir. Do you know how many infidels people have given up upon their faith because they hear preachers tell them that, that the sin that you commit in your little short life, God is going to burn you forever. Mm. And he's not just going to burn you forever, he will take pleasure in burning you. Mm. Mm. <laughs> tell me you've never heard that before. I've heard it before. I, 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 the picture they paint of God is such a negative picture as if he is a tyrant. That is a lie against God. That's right. Then they steal God's name. People behave as if they're God. You know, all these nice robes and your worshipness. Your Highness, your most pontate. The biggest titles they take upon themselves. You, you know, people feel insulted. I know folks who feel insulted. You know, my name is Sheldon Bryan. People feel, um, um, I know some people feel insulted if you call them by their name that their mother gave them. Thank you. Know. People introduce themselves, I am the right, most reverent, most high, uh, doctor, exalted, above men, Sheldon Ricardo Bright. You will address me as such, amen? Come on, say amen, church. <laughs> if you insulted that he gives you a name, call you by the name that your mother gave you. In fact, when they get in these positions, they no longer use their birth name because they have been exalted. Next, next slide, next slide. See, because blasphemy, we have to understand, is when you speak evil of God, that's blasphemy. And then there's another form of blasphemy. Next slide. When you speak Speak negatively about something that's holy. Next slide. And this is the last slide. The Jews answered him saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. Why? Because that thou, being a man, being a man makest, thyself. makest thyself God. 
It's blasphemy when you are, as a human being, present yourself as God. So let's go through some things here. Who is our judge? So when you tell people that they're going to hell, you know what you just become? You just put yourself in the place of God. Are you hearing me, church? Are you hearing me? No, 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 no. The churches back in the Middle Ages did that by saying, you're going to hell because of what you did. But we can work something out. Are you hearing me? We can work something out. If you give me $5,000, we will say some prayers to you that will forgive you of all the sins past, all your sins present, and all your sins future. Come on now, that's, that's power. <laughs> you, I know you're going through a hard time, my sister. And we love you. If you give us $20,000, because we have the keys, are you seeing what I'm saying? We have the triple keys. Not just one key. We have the key to hell. We have the key to earth here, temporal matters. We have the key to heaven. You just give us $20,000. And we work it over. We don't have to worry. And, 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 and I want to make this very clear. See, blasphemy happens all the time in church. All the time. Some churches believe they are the only true church because they have a priesthood that is unbreakable. That's what the Catholic Church says. Do you know that? They teach that the reason they have power is because Jesus anointed Peter to be the first bishop of Rome and Peter has anointed each bishop successively. They call it papal succession. Check it out. And I'm not saying anything bad about them. That's what they believe. Do you follow what I'm saying? Their authority comes from an unbroken line of popes. And they say all you all Christians who worship in these other churches, it's not doing anything for you. Do you know why? Because you don't have a Pope who's been blessed by the true Pope. Are you here? I'm going to touch another religion. The Mormon church will tell you that they have the restored gospel. Have you heard this before? And what does the restored gospel mean? It means every single other church is in error. But the angel Moroni came down from heaven and uh, gave the priesthood to Joseph Smith. And now he has the authority to give the priesthood to whomever he wants. And so if you're not attached to that priesthood, it doesn't matter what happens in your church. That's not doing anything good for you. The Jehovah's Witnesses believe that God's channel of truth is the Watchtower Society. So unless it comes through their publication, it doesn't matter what anybody else says, it's wrong and it's evil, but whatever comes through their conduit, their channel, is the truth. Are you hearing me today? I haven't said anything negative. I'm telling you what they believe. That's blasphemy. And sometimes as Adventists, we blaspheme too. Can I touch on it a little bit? I'm going to say it. 
Because we believe we have the truth. And because we have the truth, it means that we are right and everybody else is wrong. And that is a misconception of Seventh-day Adventist beliefs because Seventh-day Adventists believe we are in the lineage of the reformers. Are you hearing me? What Luther started, we are continuing. We don't believe that we are the only true church. I will say this. We believe we are the remnant church. Which means we believe we have a message for the last days. What's the difference between that? Check our Adventist beliefs. We believe in a universal church. Am I talking the truth? Yes. Please say amen. Because I, I, I don't want to be standing here by myself. We believe in a universal church, right? And unlike many Christian churches, we believe the universal church is bigger, listen to me, bigger than the names of any church books. We believe in the universal church. And then with the belief in the universal church, we believe in the remnant church. We are the remnant church, which means we have a special message. It doesn't mean that we are the conduit to salvation. Only Jesus Christ is the conduit to salvation. So I want to end with this. Blasphemy. When man takes upon himself the prerogative of God. Blasphemy. And we have to be careful as a church we don't fall into the same trap that these other churches fall into. You know, people believe you are saved because you come to church on Sunday and you take part in Mass. That is it. People believe you are saved because you have the right priesthood. There is only one true priesthood. There is only one true priesthood. There is one, only one true priest, and that is Jesus Christ. And he is ministering right now in the heavenly sanctuary. That's what the Bible teaches. But I'm going to close with this. I know you're writing, but can I have you come up a little bit for me? One second. See, in order for blasphemy to work, and turn around to the audience. <laughs> Again. See, this is how blasphemy works. Remember, we talked about two phases of blasphemy. To speak negatively against, and then to take God's prerogative. Take God's prerogative. Blasphemy says, uh, not working. He's not doing anything for you. When was the last time he did anything for you? You know, speak negative about him. Not a good leader. His intercession doesn't work. His, his forgiveness isn't true. It's not real. It's not complete. You say all the negative things. And then you say, why don't you come to me instead? I'm always here. You know, if you come to me, I'm open 24 hours a day. You know, I will listen to whatever you have to tell me. And you get instantaneous results with me. Because, you know, with me, as long as the transaction happens the way it's supposed to happen, you're, forgi you're forgiven just like that. So the blasphemy that is happening in churches is Jesus' priesthood is being substituted by other priesthoods. Are you hearing me, church? If you miss this, you miss everything. Jesus' priesthood is being substituted. People say God takes too long. You can't really pray to God. When you pray to God, do you hear him? Does he answer you? Does he talk to you in an audible voice? Most of the time, does he talk to you, church? No, he doesn't. But when you talk to the priest, when you talk to your bishop, when you go to your pastor, he's right there. 
empathizing with you. You follow what I'm saying? We have the system set up that any problem you're going through, you just come to us. And we will take care of it for you. And, and little by little, I'm trying to describe it. This is very difficult to do. Little by little, the priest of Jesus gets put on the back burner. And man takes the place of God. That's why I was closing. I'm trying to get you to connect with Jesus. Because I am not a substitute for Jesus. Are you hearing me? The pastor's prayers aren't any more powerful than your prayers. Do you believe that? Amen. There is no amount of money that you can give to the church, this church, or any church, that will clear your conscience of sin. Because your conscience isn't cleared by how much you give to the church. It's cleared by when you make a connection with Jesus, and His blood cleanses you from sin. And He does that for free. Blasphemy. When churches take people for a ride, we say, if your relationship is good with your pastor, you're on your way to heaven. And if it's not, well, you know, the pastor can kick you out of the church. And if you ever got kicked out of the church, what would you do? Our faith has to be built on Jesus Christ. Amen? And so today we're closing. Where is your faith built? Is it built on an earthly creature? Whether you call it a priest or a pastor or a minister or whatever, is it built on an earthly representative? Or is it built on what Jesus is doing in heaven? Amen. The Bible says as times get tougher, people want something they can touch. It's the idolatry of the flesh. We want something we can touch. We can look up. We can say, behold Israel, here are your gods. But will you choose to worship the true God who doesn't live in temples made by hands? doesn't matter how pretty your church is, how much money you spent building it. That is not the temple. The temple is in heaven. And I do not care what religion it is, we are not in the business of making temples. This structure is not a temple. It is a meeting place for the body of Christ, the people of Christ. We have no temples here. And so if you want to make your connection with Christ stronger, stand with me as we pray. You want to say, Jesus, you are our God. You are the only true God. We will not be swayed by what men say. But we will trust in you and trust in you only. <coughs> Father, we thank you for just blessing us to understand what this false system of religion seeks to do. It seeks to displace you by discrediting your ministry. And so, Lord, we pray that let every other ministry be nothing. Let us decrease so that you can increase. Let our concept of what it is to be the church become so minimal that the concept of what it is for you to be God becomes maximum in our minds. And help us, Lord, to find in you the only strength of our joy the only source of our joy and strength. And in everything, help us to worship you only. It's my prayer that God's people say, Amen. 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 Let us sing hymn number 280, When He Cometh, When He Cometh, to make up His joy, as our closing hymn, as we leave to fellowship.